Hello everyone. Let's continue with lecture one. In the previous lecture, you have learned about propositional logic. And today we are going to continue with application of propositional logic and also some extra material like quantifiers which are very useful in addition to is propositional logic as well. Uh, uh, here I've listed some applications of propositional logic for you. You can see translating English sentences among them. Inside the book, you can observe many examples regarding this that we are trying to convert propositional logic into English sentences. It's very useful, especially for artificial intelligence when we are trying to design a human robot humanoid robot and such conversion could be very useful for you you can go through many examples that you have inside the book regarding them uh, but usually when uh, we ask you questions in weekly assignments we avoid such conversion to english sentences and as i uh, mentioned in the previous announcement if you have any tr uh, problem regarding time management for studying your book, just wait until the third week that we will give you weekly assignments. Then you have better understanding that what we are going to ask you also for the exams. So in, uh, in the applications list, you can also observe uh, one topic regarding one chapter in the book. And if you are interested, also you can go through a chapter, but we are not going to cover it in, in this course. But if you have any question about it, don't hesitate to ask me. For example, in that chapter, you can observe such an example. That's how we can convert such propositional logic into this format. Like, for example, we have three propositions, P, R, and Q and you see how it looks as a compound proposition. For example, this transition changes R to negation of R. It means that if this one is true, this one is not true. And this transition just shows the disjunction of Q and negation of R. And you can see we can continue until we reach the compound proposition. And how can I know about the true value of this one? You already know how to construct truth table. But later we will see that by knowing different laws or by knowing different theorems, and it's not necessary to uh, construct the whole truth table because it can be time consuming if you are dealing with so many variables. Now, what's the meaning of tautology and contradiction? Because we can, we will hear about them a lot. Um, I took some definitions from the book because they are well defined and let's go through them together. A compound proposition that is always true, no matter what the truth values of the propositional variables that occur in it, occur in it, it is called tautology. So it means that no matter what are the truth or false values of your propositions, for example, P and Q, any a compound proposition of them in that specific definition should give you truth value at the end of the table. If that's the case, for example, this is not a tautology, but let's say no matter what are the values of P, Q, R, if this compound proposition give you truth value at the end all the time, it means that this is a tautology. But anyway, this is not the case in this example. And whenever instead of truth value, we will have always false values, and that one we call contradiction. And we will use them a lot inside theorems as well. So what do we mean by saying logically equivalent propositions? The compound propositions P and Q are called logically equivalent if we have such a relation between them. And this relation should be a tautology. It means that this one should always give you truth values at the end. 
And when we have such biconditional case, you remember from the previous session that if P, for example, is true, Q should be true. If P is false, Q should be false. It's not possible that P is true and Q is false and vice versa. Uh, and we will also talk about, again, biconditional cases and what's the difference between this one and just uh, if version instead of if and only if. So we use this notation for uh, having logically equivalent cases. So we have two propositions, and between them we use these three lines. So instead of just equality, we have extra line to uh, specifically say this is equivalent. We have different laws in our book. One of the famous ones is uh, Morgan's law. It shows that the negation of conjunction between, for example, two propositions will lead to one uh, equivalent uh, compound proposition. And this is the way we can show it. We apply negation to them. So P will change to negation of P. Uh, this conjunction will be changed to disjunction. And Q will be changed to negation of Q. How can we prove such uh, laws? For sure, you can use a uh, truth table. But later, when you learn about different laws, you can even use them in order to uh, show the complicated version ones because it may be time consuming to show everything using truth value and it doesn't make any sense. So, for conjunction and disjunction, you can see it's pretty much similar. But whenever you have negation, so you already know how to apply it to propositions. Negation of conjunction will be disjunction and vice versa. You see? And there are some others, uh, other logical equivalences that uh, you can see in this table. Everything is pretty much clear. You can go through them one by one. Uh, let me also talk about this part, that when we show T or F, what do we mean by that? It means that this is always true and this is always false. And that's why when you calculate the conjunction between this proposition and this uh, true, always truth proposition, it means that for sure the conjunction of them will be a subset of these two sets because if it is always true, it's like the universal set and we are looking for a subset of that. And by using such logical equivalences, it's possible to come up with so many new formulas. And those are the formulas that we are using in different sciences like uh, physics, chemistry, computer science, and so on. And uh, that's why these are the things that are happening behind the curtain. Now, Everything is based on logic. All mathematical reasoning and all formulas that we are using are based on these logical equivalences. Of course, uh, I cannot expect from you guys to prove uh, such uh, formulas yourself or construct it yourself. This is usually the job of pure mathematicians. That's why in this course, we are going to focus on the applications more than just discrete mathematics itself. All right, some other important logical equivalences we can see here. I think I received a question. Let me see uh, if there is something I can answer. And I will continue. All right, Spara, uh, please ask your question. You mean on this one?
Let me take a look. You say identity loss and domination loss. Let me take a look. You are asking why the name. What do you mean by name changing? I mean, uh, it shows that when this is true, then uh, the conjunction of any proposition with true will, will be equivalent with P itself. So what do you mean by changing the names of them? Ah, I see. You you are saying that what's the difference between identity loss and domination loss? Yes, uh, your friends mentioned them. That uh, at the end you can see that uh, you will have T and F in the right side of the equivalence instead of uh, just the proposition. All right, so let's continue. So here are there are some uh, extra logical equivalences for you. What's the difference between these ones with the previous one? You can see implication inside them. So when you see such a thing, uh, it's not as easy as before, like uh, Morgan's law, and you can see an uh, applic implication could be equivalent to such a term with disjunction. So actually, this one is very famous, but uh, if you are you see it for the first time, uh, it doesn't maybe make sense at the beginning. But you know how we can prove them just uh, constructing the truth table and you can show them that these two are equivalent. And here now we have uh, biconditional cases. So instead of just one-sided uh, implication, now they are two-sided. So there are some other important equivalences that you can take a look here. So please go through them and practice with them. Okay, uh, I guess I received another question. Actually, it's better to wait for the um, for the lectures to be over than ask your questions, but it's okay. Uh, so Ahmed is asking, are you going to solve some questions? We will going to solve some questions. Uh, when we receive the weekly assignments. As I said, you need to see which questions I'm going to uh, ask you later. And sometimes inside the lectures, I include some questions for you so that you will see the examples. Because if I want to mention example for each one of the topics, for sure, we won't have time in the lecture. So we will focus it on, in the assignments. And as soon as you will receive assignments, uh, the, Next week after receiving your assignments, we will talk about the assignments in the lecture hour. So you will see how we can deal with uh, related questions. And uh, Mohammed is asking whether we need to memorize all these laws. Uh, it's not possible to memorize all of them, but they are very useful. Because if you want to use them in your theorem, for example, then if you don't know, for example, about Morgan's law, it means that from the beginning you should start a truth table and it will be very time consuming. But as I said, I'm looking for applications. I don't want you guys to prove things mathematically. So you will see, a little be patient and after seeing the weekly assignments, uh, you, you would know that in which segment of the book you should uh, concentrate more. Yes, and for sure we need to memorize the name of them because if you want to use them inside the theorem, 
then you should say based on Morgan's law, this is the case. Then you don't need to construct the table. If you don't remember the name, that would be a problem because you need to construct the true table if you don't know that name. Okay, guys, let me uh, continue with the lecture. And after that, if you have questions, for sure, you can ask me. All right, this term is important as well. A compound proposition is satisfiable if there is an assignment of truth values to its variables that makes it true. It means that among these propositions, like we have P, Q, R, if uh, we can manage it somehow to have truth uh, values of one of them, and then the whole compound proposition will be true, then this uh, compound proposition, we can consider it as satisfiable. Otherwise, it's not. Like, for example, this one. If I consider P true and Q false, then you can see if I consider the whole compound proposition, I can construct a truth case. We won't reach contradiction all the time. So in that sense, uh, we will say uh, this compound proposition is satisfiable. And you can see if this one is true, all of this term inside this parenthesis will be true. And if Q is false, then negation of that will be true. And because of that, the disjunction of all of these, no matter what's the truth or false value of R, will be true. So true, conjunction, true. It will give you true. You see, you found the solution to receive true at the end. In that case, you can say this is satisfiable. Otherwise, the compound proposition is not unsatisfiable. So if they ask you if this compound proposition is satisfiable or not, you would say yes, and you will show one example that what happens if, for example, P is true and Q is false, and you show it that yes, this is satisfiable. Doesn't matter what's the value of R. Now, one application we could uh, we mentioned was related to logical puzzles. And Sudoku, I'm sure all of you know about it. For example, I don't ask questions about solving Sudoku for sure, because it's not related to our course. Uh, maybe our grandfathers, <laughs> they can solve this one much better than us. They can teach us. So we don't want to discuss it in our course. But you know, it's, uh, this is the case that we can solve these uh, questions using uh, logical propositions. And I mentioned about uh, satisfiable compound propositions because for sure you can find the truth value for all of them and find the answer. Like each one of these blocks, they should contain uh, values from one to nine without any repetition. And uh, at the end, we should have the case that for each row we have the same situation and for the columns as well and we should arrange the numbers so that uh, the rules stand as i mentioned so this is uh, one application related to sudoku uh, let me answer your questions after uh, finishing the lecture and i will answer them one by one for sure so uh, we will have we have also predicate logic I'm confused by the picture. Like for example, this one we say existence quantifier, not you know, necessarily universal one, because this one we consider as the universal one. But what I wanted to show you in this picture that we have combination of quantifiers and predicates like this, so that we can make a more complicated version of logic, not just only propositions. So the combination of all of them could solve other uh, problems that we have in mathematics and could be very useful for mathematical reasoning. Uh, let's go through them. And what do we mean, for example, by predicate and propositional function? Uh, take a look at these two examples. Now assume that px is a function which denotes x minus 3 
is more than 10. This is not a proposition, right? Because we cannot say it is true or false. But if we give values as input of this function, then this one can be a proposition after that. So by itself, it's not a proposition. So this one is a proposition because we know that 2 minus 3 is not more than 10. So we say this is false. But 20 minus 3, 17 is more than 10, then this is true. So you see, we need such terms in order to uh, solve many problems in mathematics uh, easier. Now, example two. You saw such things a lot in your computer programming. Like, if x more than 0, then add 1 to x. In mathematics, we use this uh, notation. In uh, computer science, we just use this, uh, equality, right? But here, we use this notation so that we show this is different from uh, assignment of numbers and uh, equality. So, I mean, x plus 1 will be assigned to x now. But in computer science, if we use only equation, it has the same meaning. So uh, be careful about it because the notations time to time can be different uh, from one major to another. So if x is more than 0, then add 1 to x. That's what it means. So you can see we use them. We can uh, go through the mathematical reasoning using the predicates just like this. Also, we need quantifiers. Let's see what does it mean and what's, for example, universal quantifier. Like in this case, the universal quantification of this function is the statement px for all values of x in the domain. So they show it by using this notation for all x's inside this function. So either it is true or false, and uh, we can talk about it. And this counterexample that you can see here, we will talk about in details in the next lecture for sure. So we already know about for all x's. Here is another quantifier for you. There exists uh, one x which holds for this function. And this, these ones we call statements. So when this statement is true, when for all x's, this is true. But if you find even one x which is not uh, hold for this statement, then this is false. And let's take a look at this one. When you compare it, you understand it better. Because in this case, we say there is an x for which the x is true. Even if you find one, then this statement is true. When this is false, when for all of them, for all x's inside this function, this is false. And if you even find one which is not the case, then it makes it true. Because all the statements, like proposition, could be either true or false. So we need to know about the orders when you want to, for example, write such a term. That what it means. How can I interpret that? The combination of them sometimes could be confusing. Now we have this uh, propositional logic, and we have quantifier, and we have some uh, functions here. So how can I interpret that? Uh, we say that uh, quantifiers should be looked at first. Apply this one first. So let's see. This one is different from this one. So when I write it like this, it means that apply this one first and this, and then find the disjunction. So you see, if I don't do that, by accident, I may consider this one. First, I consider the disjunction, then apply it for all. They have different meanings, but we should be careful. Whenever we see that for all or their exist as quantifiers, apply them first, then consider the uh, propositional logic that we talked about. And whenever uh, we can apply such quantifiers to our variables, then we call them bonded ones. And when uh, we don't have such quantifiers for them, then they are free. So 
logical equivalences involving quantifiers. So what's the difference between this one and the equivalent that we talked about before? You see here now we have two statements instead of logical propositions. We should be careful about that too. Like we had a lowercase p, lowercase q. Now we have two statements. But uh, we have some uh, logical similarities anyway. Like uh, if this one is true, this one is true. If this one is false, this one is false. We have the same logic behind it. But it is applying for statements because it uh, contains quantifiers. And because of that, we show it by uppercase, not to be confused with uh, the propositional logics. And you see, we use if and only if uh, term here. And we use it for such uh, equivalences. So whenever we have such a case that uh, both of them at the same time should be either true or false, then we use if and only if. Otherwise, if we use only if, it means that we are talking about just the conditional case. If this is biconditional one, then if and only if. So we will hear that a lot because of biconditional cases. So let's see one example which we apply negation to, uh, for example, quantifier and the function. So in this case, you can see that when we apply negation to for all case, you will receive there exists. And it will be exactly the same story. If we had there exist case as a quantifier, and negation of that would be for all x instead of there exist. And we have also here for the function negation, and we exactly write it here. These two statements are equivalent. It means that you can use this one instead of this or vice versa. And this one is very useful whenever we are trying to prove theorems in mathematics. So you see, for it's getting harder to have a truth table now. It's better to know about such equivalents and it makes our job much easier for theorems. And as I said, uh, as soon as you will see the uh, assignments, weekly assignments, then you would know that I don't expect you guys to prove uh, complicated mathematical uh, theorems, for example. For the time being, let's just get ourselves familiar with these terms. And later, as soon as you will see the examples, things will get much easier for you. So you are now ready to read the uh, subsections of chapter one. Part one, two, three, four. We already cover these topics. There are so many examples inside them. You can go through them as much as you can. And obviously, it won't be even feasible to go through all of the examples. But as much as you, you have time, please go through them. And be sure that as soon as you will see the uh, weekly assignments, things will be much easier for you. And you can manage your time easier. So if you have any questions, let's go through them one by one.